Um, so I'm going to uh, talk about link building today. And because I only have 20 minutes, I'm trying to keep it nice and short. So it's fairly top level. Um, so I'm going to be talking about connecting the dots, link building strategies, and best practices. Um, so what am, am I going to cover? So first, I'm going to talk about why we need links, really basic, quick overview. And then secondly, what makes a good link and what makes a bad link, just so that you can recognize them in the wild. Um, and then uh, I'm going to dive a little bit into how to decide your link building strategy and a couple of ideas for best practices. Uh, but again, I don't have time to talk about every single thing you can do. I've just got three examples and then a little bit of a list later down as well. Um, so I'm going to start with a pop quiz, <laughs> everyone's favorite class. Um, so I've got a question for you guys. Which site will rank better? <laughs> Is it site A with 12,000 backlinks, or is it site B with 12? So I've got a hint. There's only one, there's only one correct answer. Oh, I had to do it. It depends. So um, in this talk, I will uh, go over uh, what it depends on. In, in top line. And so I will explain that not all links are equal. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the more links means the better or better rankings. Um, so that was a lovely little beginning. But why do we need links? Um, so in short, as we all probably know, links are a ranking factor. Um, so someone here on Twitter asked uh, the question, what's the most important ranking factor? And John Muller from Google says awesomeness. Um, so that is. <laughs> You know, quite you know, vague answer. Many things could make a website awesome. Um, but what we do know <laughs> is that links um, is an important factor. Um, so content quality is definitely important. Um, and that is something that we've, I think a lot of you in the room have focused on in terms of your SEO and ranking efforts. Um, but we, um, we know that Google is quite good at recognizing spammy, shitty content versus good content. But it's not always very good at recognizing good content from very good content. So backlinks is just a way in which you can demonstrate to Google that your content is the very good one over the kind of good one. Or, you know. So um, what I think that most of you have seen before is the EAT acronym, EEAT. Um, and EEAT refers to a set of principles that Google has put together that you can find online um, that shows uh, what good content looks like. So I think a lot of people will have thought about EEAT a lot while writing stuff. Um, so you can use all these examples to write really nice content uh, with you know, really relevant experience, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but there are certain parts of this content quality that you can't just right. Um, so for example, trustworthiness isn't just something that you can put on the page. Um, so I just wanted to make the point that uh, some of these um, quality content principles can be demonstrated through links. So for example, trustworthiness is something that you can demonstrate by having really, really good quality links to your site. Um, so we've established really quickly why we need links, uh, but we also need to know what makes a good link. Um, so essentially, good links are links that demonstrate those EEAT values. Um, so anything that will help you strengthen the quality of your content on your site. Um, so a, a few examples here. Um, so links can demonstrate that you have authority uh, in a certain field. So if um, you, the backlinks can demonstrate that you have a quality, um, quality website. So essentially, a backlink can, vote as, can act as a vote of confidence from an authority figure within a certain field or in general. So BBC News, we all know, is fairly well established. Um, and if they link to you, it can kind of show an authoritativeness. Um, and uh, the other thing that can make a good link is a link coming from a domain that's trustworthy or that's deemed as good. Um, so this is just a screenshot from Ahrefs where you can see a score out of 100, roughly, um, of how good the domain the BBC is. Um, so that is not something that Google uses, but it's just an estimate. Uh, and you can use lots of different tools to estimate the quality, um, the quality of a backlink. Um, but just to make sure you don't ever use that as the only 
basis for your decision because they are just estimates. Um, but the higher scores or whatever metric you use isn't the only thing that you should use to decide whether something is a good link or not uh, because sites that would have a lower score um, can also be really valuable. So here, if you want to demonstrate expertise in a certain topic, you can get links from websites that talk about that topic or that already have expertise in that topic. So that is about uh, demonstrating topical relevancy. So in this example on the screen, I've got some coverage from the website HR News, who write about HR News. <laughs> um, and they have written an article, Will HR be replaced by AI? Um, so AI is lovely, everyone loves AI. Um, so <laughs> they have written that article and they link to my client who sells HR software. So it's HR people talking about HR, linking to my HR client. So that is <laughs> very, very useful, relevant content. Um, so I just, before we move on about you know, what is a good link, I just wanted to note directories can get a bit of a bad rep. Um, so there is a lot of spammy directories out there, but there are still some good directories as well. Um, so I will now show why this is an example of a good directory link, and they actually just sum up what a good link looks like in general. So the Hertfordshire directory is on a trusted domain. It's a government.co.uk domain. It's not something that you can just make yourself, that website. You can't just whack that up. Um, uh, it's a gen genuinely useful directory that has editorial control. So if I submit my client's website to this directory, it doesn't just get published. Someone reads it and checks it, and you know, they check it on a regular basis as well. Um, and it has relevant content, it's local businesses, it's geographically relevant because my client operates in the area. So it doesn't, you know, it, it actually hits all of the boxes of the EEAET <laughs> uh, acronym. So that is just a, a quick conclusion of what a good link can look like. Um, just before we move on, um, I've got to mention no follow links. Um, so Google used to essentially like all links. Uh, but then everyone started spamming them all over the place. I'm sure you've seen this happen. Comment sections, whatever. Everyone always just shoving them all over the place. Very annoying. Um, so they've had to add an option to make a link no follow, which meant that they weren't going to count it towards their overall score. Um, so does this mean that um, no follows links are worthless for SEO? Um, as always, <laughs> it depends. Um, even if it actually wasn't going to help your ranking at all, it can still be really valuable. There's lots of newspapers that actually blanket no follow loads of um, all of their links, um, but that doesn't mean that you know getting published on those sites is useless. Actually, people might read those papers and see your brand. Uh, they might click on it and go to your website. Um, but recently. Um, Google has actually uh, said that they now no longer um, see nofollow as a directive. It's now a hint, which means that actually it can help um, your backlink profile, your ranking. Um, so basically, they said, we don't care whether you want to <laughs> give this follow or not. If we think it's useful, it's going to be useful. Um, so uh, essentially, what is a good link? A useful one. <laughs> Um, so we've talked about what good links are. Now we also need to consider what bad links look like. Um, and actually, it's really not that hard. It's just like it says on a tin, um, anything spammy or something dishonest is a bad link. Um, so they're really easy to recognize. Um, and <laughs> I've, I've added in some lovely screenshots from Mark's inbox, and he gets a like 100 a day or whatever. Um, so this is the kind of thing that people get a lot, which is you know, begging you for money um, to just publish something on their site. Um, th this does include guest posting. And guest posting isn't evil, but if you're going to do that kind of thing, make sure that it's useful for your brand, that actually your target audience goes to those websites and cares about the content that you're writing, um, and make sure it's no-followed. Um, so this is another example, paying for cheap backlink services. Google knows this is terrible. Gmail also knows. Um, it's just the same thing at the higher scale. Um, and here, the other thing, you know, adding your website to loads of directories 
it's just not going to do anything. Google will just ignore all of these links, right? So most of the time, if you start doing all this stuff, it's just not actually going to help you. Um, but it can also harm you. So if you are putting loads of effort, you're not only wasting time, it is technically, um, it is potentially harmful as well. Um, yeah. So you can find a whole list of all of the things that Google considers link spam on the website, well, on this link. Um, and I'm not going to list all of them, but they are there. Um, so now we're just going to dive into um, how to decide uh, your backlink strategy. Um, so first off, when you get started, you need to know what your competitors are doing. Um, so what you'll start off with is just looking at the situation against your closest organic competitors. Um, so you review how many backlinks you have and how many referring domains you have and the same thing for your competitors. So I've just made a really little bit of an example here of my client site having like 100 referring domains and the competitors all having more than 2,000. Um, and even if you look at the domain rating, which is a quality rating of the site um, essentially, uh, my client was 22 uh, versus 60 and 70 for the competitors. So what we can see here is that it's a really, really competitive landscape. So we know that when we start building links that we've got quite the um, challenge there. Um, so then what you're going to do after that is look at all of those links that your competitors have that you don't have. And this actually is a really, really short list here, but it would output like loads of lines most of the time. Um, you can use a bunch of different tools for this. But here, what we can see is literally just everyone that links to one of the competitors and not me. Um, so when you look at that really, really long list, um, it can help you decide what tactics to use. So what conclusions could you draw from a really long list of websites that don't link to you, but link to your competitors? It's an opportunity. It's a list of opportunities. It's a list of people to target. So what type of sites are there? So when we go back, you can see in this example, we've got some news websites up here, and a lifestyle site, and then a directory from a government website. Um, you can also pick out what themes are um, being written about. So actually read the content of all of the things that are in that list. Don't just read the headlines, but actually read the content. So what are the themes? So for the client that I was working with, um, it, it was a client um, that is a rehabilitation services. Um, so that was all about addiction, uh, also about um, ADHD and addiction, all the kinds of stuff. Um, and then you can review what the types of content is. So for my client, it's not going to be product reviews because they don't have products, so their competitors don't either. Um, but it is going to be things like interviews or guides or how to quit drinking or uh, expert commentary or things like that. So with all of that information, you can start building a picture of what kind of tactics you could use um, to that could result in, in similar coverage. So. In a way, you are kind of stealing the ideas from the competitors. <laughs> so this um, is something that can really help you set kind of priority um, when you get started. Um, but I can't go into any more detail without explaining some link building tactics. Um, so I've only picked out three for you today, again, because I'm going to run out of time otherwise. Um, so I've, I'm going to talk really briefly about uh, digital PR campaigns. I'm going to mention newsjacking and reactive um, link building. So the first um, example is digital PR campaigns. So this basically just is creating news where there isn't any. <laughs> um, so you could find out something really interesting and newsworthy that your client has or you have something really useful to say about or um, something really interesting piece of content or a data led story, something that a writer or a, um, a journalist doesn't have the time to do. Um, so th it's really important to think of topics that are um, that are that your client act or you have actually got real insight in and that real expertise in, um, because otherwise it's just going to be bland and boring and something that ChatGPT could write. Um, but you can use things like freely available data. Um, which in this example is what we did. So this is a, a blog page which is called The Real Gateway Drugs in the UK. 
Um, so they, we just used freely available data from the government um, and it was about the root cause of addiction issues um, which were not drugs but it was mental health issues and it was uh, finance issues and things like that. Um, so it was just using that kind of data and then uh, we sent it to a load of um, different uh, websites that were writing about those types of topics. So this is just an example of coverage that we got from the main headline, which is the UK has become a breeding ground for addiction issues. It's a bit dramatic, <laughs> um, but that's what they went with. Um, so that's just one of the examples. Uh, but actually what we also did here was look at regional uh, angles. So this freely available data was massive data set. So here is an example. Um, we said Liverpool ranked third in the country for alcoholism. What are the factors behind this? Uh, and how do we address it? Um, and so in both of these examples, the client has then given commentary um, that because they actually know how to address it, um, it was actually really, really valuable. Um, yeah, so that is just in a nutshell, digital PR campaigns. Um, I will now move on to newsjacking, which is in a way quite similar, um, but instead of coming up with something new, you are jumping on something that's already out there. Um, so in this example, it's just like the life of a news story. I didn't make this graphic. Um, so, <laughs> um, so you can see here the story breaks over here, um, and then at some point people get bored of it. So if you start doing newsjacking, at the dotted line somewhere is too late and nobody's going to care. Um, but if you do it right after it breaks, the journalists are going to try to work out like how to spin stories around this topic um, and then you can add value in that particular moment. Uh, but you do have to be careful because if you start doing this kind of thing over really sensitive topics, of which there are many, um, it can be icky. So I've got a bit of a sad example here of The Gap, which is a clothing brand, trying to do a funky tweet about Hurricane Sandy. Um, it's just really insensitive. And actually, this is one of the like least offensive versions that I could find, <laughs> because I don't want to go into all of the sad things. Um, so really, really important not to just do it for the sake of doing it. You actually have to have something valuable to say. Um, so here's an example of something that we did for the same client. Um, so what happened here is there was a news story about Fortnite addiction lawsuits. Uh, loads of loads of newspapers were writing about this because it was quite a dramatic thing. Um, but then what we did, and I actually think it was Mark's idea to credit him, <laughs> um, was uh, look at the world's most addictive video games. Um, so everyone was talking about Fortnite and Mark was like, actually, there's far, far more addictive video games out there. Let's put them on a list. Um, so that's what we did. Um, and actually, we gained, I think, 59 pieces of coverage from that because it was just very timely. So here's an example. Um, <laughs> more people seeking help for Minecraft addiction than crack cocaine. <laughs> Every time I look at this picture, I think that's Parmesan. But maybe that's just me. <laughs> um, <laughs> it really does. Um, say more about me than the picture probably. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so this is, you know, potentially a bit of a dramatic headline, but that's what, you know, the target aud audience lad Bible in this particular case really liked. Um, but, um, oh, sorry, I'm over moving on too fast. Um, yeah, so basically the, the conclusion of newsjacking is you have to do it in a timely way and you have to do it in a sensitive way and you have to have something useful to say. Accidentally rhymed, all right. Moving on. So reactive, I'm going to turn my back to this GIF, it's far too distracting. Um, reactive basically is a tactic that means you are responding to a, a request from a journalist that's already out there. So a writer or a journalist will be working on a story and then thinking, actually, I need a commentary from an expert here and just going out to places um, to ask for it. So here's just a bunch of examples of places where people go to request insight and to give insight. Um, so I've just uh, rounded up a few examples here. So this is from a tool called Quoted. Um, someone from Women's Health is looking for experts about artificial Christmas trees um, with suggestions about artificial Christmas trees. Um, and our client sells artificial Christmas trees, so we were able to, um, to send some response in for this. Um, this is one I pulled out of Twitter. 
Um, this is someone from Living360 asking for Halloween pumpkin patch events across the UK. Now, I didn't respond to this, but if I had a Halloween pumpkin patch, I would. Um, <laughs> so here's an example of some coverage that we gained um, from this kind of reactive um, stuff. So someone from ADHD Online had put on one of the tools um, a question around ADHD uh, because they said ADHD medication actually um, is technically addictive substance. It's a um, controlled substance. So does that mean that it's dangerous for people who have addiction issues or that could it lead to addiction issues? And our client, we actually had just done a story about this, so it's really nice for us. Um, but uh, basically what we uh, ended up responding with is actually it's the opposite. It's people with ADHD that are unmedicated are more likely to have addiction issues than people who are medicated. Um, and we had you know, a really relevant response a really um, nice, strong page that was on the site already with uh, sources about this. Um, and yeah, expert commentary on the, on the matter. So we got a nice link, which again is topical relevancy for us, which was very good. <laughs> um, so all of these tactics um, resulted in the classic graph go up moment for <laughs> our client. Um, so what I thought was really interesting about this particular client um, so, uh, was that um, the ranking or the average traffic um, was, there, like we said before, it was quite a big gap right, between the competitive landscape. Right? So the competitors were quite established. Um, but the traffic gap closed more than the backlink gap did. Um, so we can partially say that the other SEO people and the content people did a great job doing SEO and content. Um, but what I also um, think happened is that our link building strategy was just more targeted than that of the competitors. Um, so we've got a bunch of really relevant links from like the, the pages that we were focusing on anyway. Uh, we've got some really, really good placements um, and we just don't have so much of the guff. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so really the strategy here was looking at the competitor landscape, choosing our targets, really carefully um, and choosing our tactics carefully and not spending too much time on things that we're not going to get drive the value. Um, right, I don't have time to go over all of these in detail, but I've listed them out here for you. A couple of examples of other link building tactics that you could use. Um, so if you see other people in your competitors use this kind of stuff, you could research them and um, yeah, and try and kind of use that in your strategy. So, in conclusion, um, we've spoken about why we need links, basically because they are a ranking factor. <laughs> uh, also because they give you topical relevancy, they give you uh, trustworthiness and authority um, within your field, um, and they are a way to show Google that your content is not just good, but really good. Um, you can see the difference between a good link and a bad link by looking at whether it's useful or not <laughs> in the easiest way, I can say that. Um, and I have just outlined your strategy and the best practices two seconds ago, so I'm not going to repeat it again. Um, but yeah, that was me today. I hope you enjoyed the talk. I don't have time for questions, but I will be around. So. <laughs>